I watched a funeral um, online this week, as, as you can do now. It's a live stream. Um, I think I watched a recording of it. Um, and it was the funeral for Bill Rankin. I don't know if any of you knew Bill. I know that enough to know in Episcopal spaces, if you say a name, someone probably knew them well. Bill was known to me as the one-time dean of the Episcopal Divinity School, a legend, one of those people that called us to do something because the grace with which our lives are filled drives us to seek justice for others. He was unrelenting. I heard a story in that service that I had never heard before about Bill, and I'm calling him Bill because that's his name. I, don't, I didn't know him, never met him. When he was a student at the Episcopal Divinity School in the 1960s, Jonathan Daniels was also a student at the Episcopal Divinity School, and I didn't know this. So this is um, during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. So he was a student. Jonathan Daniels was his classmate the um, summer that Jonathan Daniels and other folks from EDS went down to Alabama um, to register people to vote. He was a student when it was reported back that Jonathan Daniels had died. Um, shot um, when he was coming, as we know this story, right, in, a, in a, uh, a shop getting a drink after being released from jail. He had been jailed because he was a local activist with, he was alongside Ruby Sales um, and was, was shot dead. Jonathan's death framed the rest of Bill's life. I didn't know that. I didn't know what had inspired a Bill Rankin. I think I had assumed that Bill Rankin had always been as inspired as, as he was kind of an I love you too, in response to God's call to him, someone said at that funeral. What an idea, never heard it before, and I love you too, to God. I've heard more than one person say that Jonathan Daniel's death catalyzed their entire lives, helped them to understand with urgency the utter cruelty of racism in this country. It formed a generation of Episcopal clergy and lay leaders. Now, Friday and Saturday, we had some meetings here to talk together about the next few years at St. Luke's, sort of our I love you too to God's I love you from here at 435 Peachtree. What does God call us to be and do in this time? What big dreams has God planted in our hearts? What necessary tasks and risks? How are we pointing to something greater than ourselves? And how are we to be about the movement of what is sacred and holy among us on the largest scales? Who is our Lazarus? Who our Jonathan Daniels? In the readings for today, we hear about buying property and we hear about sumptuous clothing and lavish banquets. We hear about a very real world of striving and power and ordinary things that sounds a lot like the world we live in. And I'm always grateful for whoever has to read that Jeremiah reading. So you gotta say something about it because that that, that's a thing, that reading all on its own. Here's the story, in case it wasn't clear with all those names, right? Jeremiah, the mighty prophet, does a real estate deal. He makes a real estate decision. He buys some land from his cousin while in jail. He is imprisoned. So he buys it from his cousin, land from among the lands that his ha family has a right to because that is how they are organized. You can't just go buy all the land and leave people without land. People need the things they need to survive. But it's land in his family or his clan that he did not inherit. Um, so, but he is paying another member of his family, his cousin. So it's a way to keep that in the family, which it should do, and to help out someone who either cannot use it or doesn't need it or needs some money. It is a truly bizarre twist in Jeremiah. Remember the prophet, and we've been hearing him every week, has been railing against the king and the people for many, many chapters because they have not treated the poor and the marginalized and the outcast with compassion. They have not rightly ordered their society, Jeremiah reminds them, and no one cares what he's saying. He's in jail, that's how well it's going. <laughs> so in today's reading, we are very close to everything Jeremiah has said, prophesied, actually happening. Babylon, Babylon is about to come in and take them away, conquer them fully, take away their people. And we get this strange interlude. Jeremiah buys some property. So much detail. He weighs out the silver. 
he gets the right price, he makes sure it's the right amount, he gives it to his cousin, they take a scroll, they record, they make a deed, basically, they put it in a jar, they bury it in the ground. Something about it must matter for there to be that much detail. God seems to say to Jeremiah, God, who instructs him to buy this land, desolation is coming, inevitable, but there is something after that. Maybe grace or hope, definitely a return. Why else would you buy land? Promise of something not yet known. You will learn to love me again, he seems to be saying to his people through Jeremiah. Jeremiah buys the land and seals the scroll in the jar and buries it for an unknown future. Sounds a little bit like us. I mean, we're not in jail, but you know, a parking lot here, a parking lot there, a lot over there. <laughs> For a church that might need that many parking spots, maybe, or a city that might grow up around us, or an opportunity to speak into a future not yet known. From a place some would have said not that long ago was a place of desolation, to believe in an inheritance and a future right here. Our we love you too to this city. What a framing for all of our living. The parable in the gospel is a brutal one. If you are a wealthy foodie clothes, clothes horse, right? Um, and if you're a wealthy foodie clothes horse that knows your history and your Bible, it's a tough story. <laughs> However, if you have found yourself ever outside a gate, maybe it is a parable of hope. Our brother Lazarus finds himself in the bosom of Abraham, the lap of the ancestors, cared for like a beloved child, it says, while the wealthy sophisticate suffers in the flames of Hades. The kingdom of God is like a rich man and the beggar at his gate, we have read. The kingdom of God is the world turned upside down, we read and just sang. Beware, you and I, we read today. God loves Lazarus too. Their times, like our times, make this a difficult teaching. God's ways are not like this world, we know that. It is as if the one who seeks justice and calls out the wrong needs a grounding in the hope inherent in a new day, a future, a place of return, a piece of land. But the one with all the security in this life requires compassion, a reading of the same law that would have told Jeremiah what land he could buy and how, that also had something to say about how we treat the outsider, the hungry, those in need. And is it not ever so? The word of God about the right ordering of our lives speaks differently to us in our specific contexts. The challenge for us would be, where is your I love you too to God's love, God's I love you, to you. Where do you need it? It seems that the nameless rich man waits too long to acknowledge that he is tied in this life to those in need near him. In the gospel reading, we read a story we know very well, in which an opportunity for grace is not taken. This parable is among the many that Paula Gooder, who um, engages in her book on the parables that we're using for our Wednesday Bible study, in this story, this rich man, again, the unnamed rich man, it's not about him really, he lives well, like most of us, but a poor and sick man lies outside of his gate and the poor man is our star. He has a name, Lazarus. It is not clear that either of them are good or bad in the ways that we might think of those things. Maybe Lazarus deserved to be there. Maybe the rich man deserved what he got. It doesn't engage any of that. It just says the rich man dies and goes to the flames. The poor man finds himself in the bosom of Abraham, comforted. The rich man asks for help for himself and for his brothers, and Abraham, the great ancestor of the people, says that if the warning of the law and the prophets were not enough, nothing will be. Woe to us, a convicting story, for you and I who eat well and those of you who are better dressed than I am. There is nothing to say that the rich man is unkind or unusually cruel, but the story does take us back to, as Paula Gooder points out, that song of Mary at the beginning of Luke, the one that tell out my soul, sings to us. 
And Luke is beautifully woven like this. The song of Mary, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Maybe the Lazaruses of the world were a little bit like Mary and Joseph and Mary's baby to whom she would sing such a song. In this string of parables we are reading in Luke week after week, we are being taught that we should never confuse the way this world works for God's justice. God has not created inequity to illustrate God's love or to help us work on our compassion. God does not bless the suffering of some and the prosperity of others. God is about something different. Now, I know you all have sat through many planning processes and we are going through two right now, one for the backyard, which is just fun, I hope, and one for the whole church, a strategic planning process. Pretty fun, but maybe not quite as much fun as the backyard. And it can feel very odd in church to sit in rooms with post-it notes and big pads of paper and map out values and goals for a church. It seems so corporate, so of this world, right? But we are of this world like we read in these readings, like Jeremiah and his jar, we are a workplace as well as a dreaming and worshiping place, right? We have HR at church. We have a maintenance plan for these fine buildings and many schedules at plans that we do to try to make our Sundays work. We watch investments and we project income. We live in this world and we live within its rules. And yet we are reminded today that God works among us in these same tools. Grace moves among us in these marketplaces and instruments. We can engage with God's work if we choose, and that is not solely an abstract idea of being kind or saying your prayers, though of course it involves that, but it is not solely in the ether as an intangible thing with a, a more, kind of a strange idea or a self-defined idea of what love is, although there is also some of that. These stories and the reading from Timothy are about the created world and its ordering of relationships and property and meals and gates with the details like the provenance of the luxurious purple dye and fabrics built in. It is of the material world, it, we are told. And there it says, where we live and work, God is there. Grace can be found there. Now, no one goes to church in these readings or even the synagogue. The scroll referenced is a scroll of sale, a deed, not a holy text. But the prophet manifests his hope in that scroll. So I wonder if you have had a Bill Rankin in your life, a Jonathan Daniels moment, one whose living showed you what living was truly about in this world, one or maybe many that put some steel in your spine and softened your heart to risk for the vulnerable, to care for those in need, to see the world aslant, to learn from the dead, maybe to commit your entire life to seek out God's movement in the world among us. One of the speakers at this funeral said that when their life was at its worst, just a mess by all of our definitions, full of their own cycles of self-harm, Bill was a friend. He didn't offer money or advice, though she needed both, but stayed a friend, an equal, a companion, in regular conversation, there when she decided to make some big changes. Now, I wonder if it would have been that simple for that rich man. I wonder which commandment it was that he missed that was the essential one. We're not told, but Timothy puts it this way, to not be haughty or set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything. They are, we are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that we might take hold of the life that really is life. For you, it might be a holding on or a settling in or it might be a profound letting go in the face of a God that seeks you out in love and waits for your response. Like the friend whose prayer that you will see, who, whose prayer is that you will see your own value, love yourself more, and make the big change. Like a church making concrete a plan for a future 
that bears witness to God's grace on this stretch of peach tree. The values of this world turned upside down like the waiting embrace of your ancestors. <laughs>